All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go over Unit 4 test. Um, this remediation, I'm going to mostly talk to you about what the content of the passage is because that's what I thought most of the issues were, was just comprehending and not understanding what you were reading. Um, so this first passage is actually a short poem called the Parda Nashin, and you got a little background about that. Um, Sarjini Naidu was an Indian poet and activist known as the Nightingale of India. She advocated for India's independent social welfare and equal rights. The Parda is a religious and social practice of seclusion in some Hindu or Muslim communities of South Asia. Women are either physically separated from males using separate buildings, screens, walls, or curtains, or they may be concealed by loose clothing and veils. Now, if you keep in mind that information and then you read the poem, you think you can make sense of what's happening. Um, again, this poet was for equal rights. And this parta is that practice of seclusion. So let's see what the poem says. We're going to go stanza by stanza. Her life is a revolving dream of languid and sequestered ease. Her girdles and her filaments gleam like changing fires on sunset seas. Her raiment is like morning mist shot opal, gold, and amethyst. Okay, so we've got a lot of similes there. A lot of vivid imagery. It sounds really beautiful. Okay, so like gleam and sunset, um, morning mist, opal, gold, amethyst. Sounds very beautiful. And then our second stanza. From thieving light of eyes impure, from coveting sun or wind's caress, her days are guarded and secure behind her carven lattices like jewels in a turban crest, like secrets in a lover's breast. And that stanza to me is showing that she's kind of kept from anything outside, the good and the bad. Okay, so like thieving light of eyes impure would be a negative, but being sh shielded from the sun or the wind, not necessarily a, a great thing. Sometimes it's good if it's very, you know, potent sun or heavy winds, but to me, it seems like a little bit of a mix um, being so closed and covered and hidden, not necessarily experiencing some of those natural things like the sun and the wind. And then the last stanza, if we take a look, we've got, but though no hand unsanctioned dares unveil the mysteries of her grace, time lifts the curtains unawares and sorrow looks into her face. Who shall prevent the subtle years or shield a woman's eyes from tears? And so in this stanza, um, we actually have a few lines that are addressed in your uh, or on your test and um, is talking about sorrow being personified here. So, but though no hand unsanctioned dares unveil the mysteries of her grace would have to do with the fact that no one is taking that part off of her. But as time goes by, so these lines here, sorry, a little wobbly, um, time lifts the curtains unaware and sorrow looks into her face, we got that personification of sorrow. Sorrow is sad. She's spent all this time secluded and hidden, and all these years, when you lift that veil finally, you see that sorrow She's been hidden. She's been prevented from kind of those liberties and those freedoms. So who shall prevent the subtle years or shield a woman's eyes from tears? And so it kind of ends on a sad note there. Um, and hopefully just kind of understanding that a little better might help you with any of those questions you may have missed. I'm going to move into our next text, which was, oh, I'm not sure it's letting me move into the next text here. There we go. I had to exit the uh, highlighter. So this next one was an excerpt from The Poison Tree, which is a tale of Hindu life in Bengal. And this one definitely was confusing for, um, for anyone, really, just, I think, because of the nature of the names and um, the setting itself is a little foreign. And so, again, this unit was cultural perspectives. So we have to kind of figure out what's going on here. Um, 
As Najenda traveled downriver by boat, a fierce storm drove him from to shore. While looking for shelter from the lashing rain, he came upon a dilapidated house where he found a girl of 13, Kunda Nadini, and her dying father. Unable to locate Kunda's aunt in Calcutta, Najendra wrote to his wife, Sergio Mackay, for assistance. Okay, so we have a man who has found a girl who seems to be more of an orphan, and he's writing to his wife for assistance. The poison tree documents the experiences of Najendra, a wealthy landowner, owner, his wife, Surgeon Mackay, and an orphan girl, Kundra Nandini, who Najendra brings home with him after a trip to Calcutta. Hindu life in Bengal in the late 19th century was grounded in the caste system, a social practice that placed every member of society into one of four castes. Each individual within a caste had a designated role in society. Surgeon Mackay's reply to Najendra's letter came in a few days. It was after this manner. In picking up a little girl, have you forgotten me? Many unripe things are esteemed. People like green guavas and green cucumbers, green coconuts are cooling. This low-born female is also, I think, very young, else in meeting with her, why should you forget me? Joking apart, have you given up all right over this girl? If not, I beg her from you. It is my business to arrange for her. In whatever becomes yours, I have the right to share. But in this case, I see your sister has entire possession. Still, I shall not vex myself much if Kamal usur usurps my rights. So I pause there and make sure I understand this. Um, what I'm noticing is that uh, Serja, who is Najendra's wife, is responding to his letter. And she's joking at first. I can tell because she says joking apart. And when she's joking in the first couple lines, it seems like she's saying, oh, look, you found this, this young girl. Maybe you're interested in her and you've forgotten about me. And again, she's doing this in a joking manner. So it kind of helps me understand their relationship. And he, she says, well, besides me joking, seriously, though, if you don't want her, I would like you to bring her home so that I can arrange for her. And to arrange for her might mean um, set her up for a better life or, you know, we're trying to figure out what she means by arrange for her. We do know that his sister, it looks like Najendra's sister, is kind of the overseer of making decisions. So I know it says, I see your sister has entire possession. So let's see. Um, and his sister's name is Kamal. So let's see what happens. Do you ask what I do want? What do I want with the girl? I wish to give her in marriage with Tara Sharon. You know how much I have sought for a suitable wife for him. If Providence has sent us a good girl, do not disappoint me. If Kamal will give her up, bring Kunda Nandini with you when you come. I have written to Kamal also recommending this. I ha am having ornaments fashioned and I am making other preparations for the marriage. Do not linger in Calcutta. Is it not true that if a man stays six months in that city, he becomes quite stupid? If you design to marry Kunda, bring her with you, and I will give her to you. Only say that you propose to marry her, and I will arrange the marriage basket. And so there's still a little bit of back and forth here. Now we understand her purpose for arrange is to arrange a marriage for her. And she um, mentions Tara Sharon. So we don't really know what Tara Sharon is at this point, but that's her plan is to bring this girl or have her husband bring this girl home and then marry her off. However, she still says, well, unless you're the one that wants to marry her, in that case, bring her home and I'll arrange everything anyway. Sounds kind of lighthearted considering she's his wife, but maybe that's part of the practice in their culture. Um, not quite sure. So continuing on, who Tara Sharon was will be explained later. Whoever he was, both Najendra and Kamal Mani consented to Serge of Mackay's proposal. Therefore, it was resolved that when Najendra went home, Kunda Nandini should accompany him. Everyone consented with delight, and Kamal also prepared some ornaments. So lots of names going on here. Um, we'll learn about Tara Sharon in a little bit, but Najendra again, is the man that found the young lady. Her name is Kunda. He's going to bring her home because his sister said, sure, let's marry her off. Okay, so she agrees with it. Surgeon Mackay's father's house was in Kanagar, 
Kanagar. Her father was Kaisatha, of good position. He was a cashier in some house at Calcutta. Surgeon Mackay was his only child. In her infancy, a, Kai a Kaisatha widow named Sramati lived in her father's house as a servant and looked after Surgeon Mackay. Sramati had one child named Tara Sharan, of the same age as Surgeon Mackay. With him, Surgeon Mackay had played, and on account of his childish, childish association, she felt towards him the affection of a sister. So there's the relationship between Serja and Tara. So it's almost like it's her little brother that she plans to try and marry off to this um, orphaned girl that her husband's bringing home. That's what it sounds like. Um, sounds like Serja was raised in a pretty decent family, and that... Um, he had a servant, and that servant is the one that has the, the boy. So, I'm trying to follow with all these characters. Shramati was a beautiful woman and therefore soon fell into trouble. A wealthy man of the village, of evil character, having cast his eyes upon her, she forsook the house of Serja Mackay's father. Whither she went, no one exactly knew, but she did not return. Tara Sharon, forsaken by his mother, remained in the house of Serja Mackay's father, who was a very kind-hearted man, and brought up this deserted boy as his own child, not keeping him in slavery as an unpaid servant, but having him taught to read and write. Tara Sharon learned English at a free mission school. Okay, so it seems like the servant, who was Tara's mother, got into a little bit of trouble with somebody else, and she left. She abandoned her son. Well, luckily, Serge's father raised him almost as if he were his own. He was able to get him educated. Afterwards, Serge Mackay was married, and some years later, her father died. By this time, Tara Sharon had learned English after a clumsy fashion, but he was not qualified for any business. Rendered homeless by the death of Serge Mackay's father, he went to her house. At her instigation, Najendra opened a school in the village, and Tara Sharan was appointed master. Nowadays, by means of the grant and aid system in many villages, sleek-haired, sing song-singing, harmless Master Babas appear. But at this time, such a being as a Master Babu was sa scarcely to be seen. So it seems like after he was able to learn, people didn't look up to him even though he was educated, just because of his background. He wasn't qualified. So um, instead, Najendra, because he's a wealthy man, was able to open a school so that Tara Sharon could teach. Um, it seems like it wasn't very prevalent back then to have uh, teachers. And so he was kind of seen as, um, I don't know, in a, a hero in a way, it seems like. Consequently, Tara Sharon appeared as one of the village gods. Well, there you go. Especially as it was known in the bazaar that he had read, he had read *The Citizen of the World*, *The Spectator*, and three books of, Luc of Euclid. On account of these gifts, he was received into the Brahmo Samaj of Debendra Babu, the Zamender of Debapur. It's a lot to say right there, and reckoned as one of that Babu's retinue, and. I don't think I really need to know exactly what everything means right here, but I do need to understand that he was he was looked up to and admired because he was the one that was able to teach the others because of his knowledge. Tara Sharon wrote many essays on widow marriage, on the education of women, and against idol worship, read them weekly in the Samaj, and delivered many discourses, beginning with, O oh, Most Merciful God. Some of these he took from the Tatwa Bautini, and some he caused to be written for him by the school pandant. He was forever preaching, Abandon idol worship, give choice in marriage, give women education. Why do you keep them shut up in a cage? Let women come out. So we can see what he is adamant about in that freedom and equality. There was a special cause for this liberality on the subject of women. Inasmuch as his own house, there was no woman. Up to this time, he had not married. Serge Mackay had made great efforts to get him married. But as his mother's story was unknown in Govindapur, no respectable Kafsa consented to give him his daughter. Many a common, disreputable Kaisa girl he met have had, but Serge Mackay, regarding Tara Sharan as a brother, would not give her consent, since she did not choose to call such a girl sister-in-law. While she was seeking for a respectable Kafsa, 
Kaisa girl, Najendra's letter came describing Kunda's, Nandini's gifts and beauty. She resolved to give her to Tara Sharan in marriage. So up to that point, no one was good enough for her little brother. And so they've agreed to marry him to Kunda. Uh, 